Good morning. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome to all of you. Uh, we have a big, big show planned today. I am going to be talking with you about face masks. So today we're going to talk about the COVID surge that is plaguing uh, the United States. We're also going to dig into a lot of research. There's a whole bunch of new research out literally today uh, and yesterday that will be greatly impactful. So I want to gear up and really kind of prepare each and every one of you because today's show um, is really aimed at any of you who are fearful, um, challenged with the idea of wearing a mask, uh, might be an anti-mask or have family that just really are taking a nonchalant, complacent attitude towards this virus. We, here in the United States, we are in a pandemic community spread, which means we have the virus at increasing infection rates every day. It is in the multiplier of exponential growth. That means that we need to take measures to lower our community spread and keep ourselves and our vulnerable community members, that includes family, friends, and even potentially ourselves, if we are not uh, aware of potentially some underlying health conditions, this virus is, is running rampant in the US. And so today I'm going to be addressing the mask holes <laughs> in today's video. And I say that with a lot of love. I know that there are people concerned about breathing and I'm going to address that. Um, and there are a lot of people that are challenging the data that we have. And so I've got a lot of research. I've actually pulled, I have a lot of research for today. This is all just new hot off the presses, but I'm going to share with you what I've pulled from my past uh, video content. So I literally went down and into my categorizing these, this is all the data we have, or I have communicated to you. There's a whole lot more out there, but this is the specific data COVID and face mask wearing and protection and transmission data that I have presented to all of you. So this is not some, I'm pulling this out of thin air um, and I just wanna communicate that. Also, I'm, I've brought um, some additional resources. These are all of the guidelines and details of how to reopen, recommendations. This is from the government in terms of our reopening, but also how to deal with this pandemic. So. Uh, welcome to all of you. Let me know where you're tuning in from. And today, just to uh, encourage social distancing, I have my keep calm and social distance Zen little fox uh, tank top on. This is kind of a nice thicker tank. It's great for around the house or working out. Um, I have Etsy links for these earrings and the tanks down below. So feel free to grab those. And for a lot of you, some of the, it's going to be a little bit of show and tell today of some options, um, I'll, I'll, I'll have links down below as well. So I didn't get a chance to update. Literally my computer, the printer was running really slow. We're having all sorts of weird internet issues. So today, specifically our topic is about how do we lower the mitigation um, and what mitigation, or what mitigation procedures do we take to lower the transmission and lower our risk of it catching this infection. So mitigation are all the activities to lower the risk. Um, so I, I phrase that incorrectly, but really I, we need to address the complacency, particularly that individuals here in the US have um, about this virus. I'm going to give you some news um, as I always do. And if you are new to our community, please give me a thumbs up. I hope you'll join, follow on Instagram or subscribe on YouTube. And uh, we have a wonderful live chat going on that's managed by Pat Wagner. And you guys are a great community of folks that are supportive of each other and our channel. So I'm grateful to see all of you beautiful faces, Christine and Kay Jefferson and Ritterack, which is Rachel, and a whole bunch of others that join every day. So uh, the US, um, right now we have 2.7 million cases. We are up to 130,000 fatalities and some new research just came out late last night um, predicting that the U.S. death toll may actually be 35 percent higher, um, given the fact that we we really we really have a breakdown in the diagnostics of the covid, meaning we weren't initially testing all of the right individuals. Our capacity is being bombarded by the current requirements of folks. Um, we had CDC guidelines that were really vague in terms of symptoms. So doctors were highly limited on who could get tested. So there could have been cases that were missed 
um, as far as positives, but also folks that we know some of the complications with COVID include heart attack, which can be fatal, uh, blood clots, strokes, that can be fatal, blood clots anywhere around the body. Um, pulmonary blood clots are very consistent with the uh, pattern of this disease, especially in the respiratory passageways, but we see this elsewhere. And strokes, we've seen a greater inc increase in the deaths across multiple states, um, and they are looking at what is that percentage of distinction and the differences there. And that's where, for instance, yesterday we reported New Jersey had uh, compiled or added uh, over 5,000, I think it was 5,000, it might've been born to that, uh, 15,000 additional deaths based on a review of the death certificates. So this is substantial. I just wanna really indicate yesterday was the US's worst day yet of positive cases. We had over 50,000 positive cases. Two and a half, three weeks ago, we were at 20,000, um, which means in the last 14 days, in two weeks, we have seen across the US an 82% increase in the infectious, really it's the infection rate, but most importantly, we've seen an increase in the positive cases. So for every one case um, that has been tested positive in the way this pandemic works is for every one positive case, you have 10 individuals who are either asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic or have COVID and are not aware of it and haven't been tested. That is what community spread is all about. For everyone, there's 10 potentially that have uh, inf are infectious. And that becomes a, a case of community spread and mitigation is really the only way to contain uh, this spread. We have 45 states um, who have seen an increase in the average positive cases uh, in a matter of a week. Uh, currently, we this week we have 38 states who are increasing um, in double digits, some triple digits. Um, Nevada, that state has had a three. Um, they've they've in one month they have three um, uh, xed their caseload, so um, they've had a significant amount of increases. And for instance, we're having mitigation starting to happen again. Mitigation meaning lockdowns, reversal of the reopening plan. We have New York that is now restricting indoor activities. Um, and there are 19 counties in California that are reimposing restrictions. And that, I don't know all the details of what that means. That might mean that there are, you know, the bar closings, beach closings, um, it might entail some of the businesses, but with this, these activities in New York and California alone, because of the population, the amount of population there, there will be a greater economic hit. And so we might see additional increases in economic rates uh, or un unemployment rates. Um, part of today's video topic was really hinged on the report that came out uh, I believe it was late Tuesday, but yesterday there was a lot of buzz in the economic world. Um, Goldman Sachs had put out an economic report showing that the only really true way to get business back up and running and for our economy to rebound, because we are in a recession, it could potentially be worse. But right now, we this report specifically highlights the efficacy of face masks. And so that's where this all kind of blends in for our topic today. Plus, we have a lot of anti-maskers that uh, just really freaked out on uh, a post I posted on Instagram, you know, just lots of chatter um, and referencing to blogs and just bogus data. Um, and that I'm going to dig into further today. Um, I do want to highlight Arizona had an, a substantial increase yesterday. They had 5,000, um, over 5,000 individuals uh, or 5,000 positive tests come back. And they, um, unfortunately, they had a really bad day in fatalities. They had 88 deaths. That is a significant jump. And right now the epicenter is Arizona because of the, that data. The percentages of the positive cases are high. Um, and then we're also seeing the fatalities. Now, the way this has been working, and we saw this in China, we saw it in Italy and Spain, the UK and here in the US, particularly we saw it in New York and some other hotspots. Um, 
the way it works is you'll have positive tests and there's sometimes a lag. Sometimes it, it's a rapid testing. Sometimes it comes back within 24 hours, sometimes 48 hours, depending on if it's a private lab, it might take longer depending on where you got your lab results um, or how, you know, how you did your tests. You know, is it serum? Is it saliva or is it the nasal uh, swab? So there are variances in terms of how, uh, how many people are taking it and the, the time lapse. So 5,000 in Arizona could have been from Thursday and Friday of last week. It could have been over the weekend. Now, here's some where this is where some things get muddied. Some states are reporting more positive cases on the weekend, and they will offset some of their data by reporting the negative cases throughout the week. So that's really kind of sketchy in terms of how the Department of Health are highlighting this data. So we are not always getting like clear definitive data. You know, everybody who took a test on Tuesday, they got the results back. That's not how it happens. And in fact, most of the time we get the reporting from states by around 3 p.m., 4 p.m. So even though the lines at, you know, the drive through are still active and people are getting swabs, they release the data. It's really the day it's from the day before, if you will. So we're lagging a little bit on that. And with that, it becomes really important that we mitigate because the lag time, both in the tests are a few days. And then the lag time between people who have tested positive, they may have been, you know, pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, and then maybe symptomatic, you know, whatever got them to take a test, maybe it was a contact tracer where they called them. There's a period of time where they're infectious and they are potentially not wearing masks and being out and about in public and spreading. So the spread is, is really critical that we, we tighten up who all is getting tested and, and rapidly get that out and about. Florida, um, there are reports in Florida, folks have been in line for seven, eight hours, they get up there, there are no swabs. So that is one critical factor. Um, if you guys are liking this, really excited about this content, please give me a thumbs up. I really appreciate it. The algorithm is just being really kind of crazy on YouTube. So I really appreciate your support and hitting the share button and really helping spread the word about this. This is really, out of everything that I talk about here, um, this is critical in the world of the pandemic is, is this particular content. Um, about mitigation and lowering our risks and keeping all of us safe. Because I know so many of you, my viewers, you all have underlying health conditions. That's how you've come to find out about me and my content and my work as a naturopathic physician, focusing on food, nutrition, whole body balancing, and then also lymphatic work and other specialties like hormones and autoimmunity and uh, post surgical work and cancer uh, treatments. So I. I really am aware that my community, more so than maybe other providers' communities, really need people to hear this because this is not just for all of you. It's for all of you. It's for all of the people you know and for random community members that you might encounter out and about. You know, the crazy Karens at the grocery store are freaking out because they want to, they don't want to wear their masks. And they could be potentially jeopardizing you all. This is my, my impetus of, of creating this content. Um, so back to the data. One of the things that we are seeing, there's a lag time from the time somebody gets tested to the hospitalization. Um, and why hospitalization rates is really crucial right now is one, monitoring our healthcare system capacity. Um, the need to bring in additional workers. We know 24, 25% of our healthcare professionals at minimum will possibly uh, be exposed. Most of the time it's external, but PPE is going to run short in some of these areas and they will be overloaded. And the hospitalization rate is a lag of about two to three weeks. So after the infection takes root and they test positive, there's usually a period of time where it further incubates and infiltrates all systems and it starts to trigger the cytokine storm and the inflammatory response and the blood clots and the breathing challenges. And we go from the dry cough to the wet, we now have pneumonia and we have uh, secondary infections. So the, there, there's a time frame. there's a lag. And what we're seeing in some of these cases, like our states last week, Arizona hospitalizations were high. I think I read the other day, um, seven states that have high hospitalization rates, Texas, Arizona, Nevada, South Carolina, Montana, Georgia, and California. 
That means that two weeks ago, three weeks ago, those were positive tests. So we're going to, what we're anticipating and why everybody is really honing in on a lot of the data that's coming out and previous data about protection, mitigation, lowering our risk of exposure, lowering the transmission rate is because we know that we are seeing 50,000 cases, positive cases today. Those folks aren't in the hospitals yet. They will be in two and three weeks. So in the middle of July, we're going to re be reporting a totally different scenario. There might be a complete meltdown and breakdown of some of these healthcare uh, facilities and systems uh, and just an overload where they have field hospitals and they're flying in healthcare workers. It could potentially be pretty, pretty radical in terms of what we're going to see. New York style is what we're anticipating. I do want to highlight, um, you know, Florida had a, a, another big day yesterday. They were at, they're at 158,000 and Texas is almost at 160,000. Um, South Carolina, I've mentioned them a few weeks, two weeks ago. I think they said, you know, we're going to be watching the beaches. Myrtle Beach could be, could potentially be an epicenter. Well, with the 4th of July on Saturday, a lot of beach goers are already there and in, uh, on the coastline of South Carolina. South Carolina's hotspot is Myrtle Beach, and they have attributed over, just right now, hundreds of positive cases from individuals who were in Myrtle Beach have traveled home. There's 100 teens out of um, like Loudoun County in Virginia um, that were in Myrtle Beach, they're back at home, they all 100 have, over 100 have tested positive. 100 uh, individuals from Roanoke um, traveled, and this is, I don't know if they were together or independent, but we've got 100 cases that contact trace to Myrtle Beach in Roanoke, Virginia. Um, 16 of 45 Ohio students, I reported those high school students that went to um, Myrtle Beach, there's 16 out of 45 that have tested positive because of exposure. Under Myrtle Beach. Today, the city council is going to vote on whether or not they're going to employ um, a mask mandate. And we're starting to see more mask mandates happening um, in, throughout cities. Right now, we're not seeing a whole lot of uh, states employing this. There are some states, but this is going to be probably more localized given the nature of this. Seems to be more in political orientation. Um, and with one of the, the aspects with masks, when we have wide outbreak or wide uh, pandemic community spread, every small little contribution really helps to lower uh, the, the risk of transmission. So this is potentially small mitigation, and I'll back it up with a whole bunch of data today. Um, but you know, given that our diagnostic capacity has been underwhelming or under underperforming, we're seeing the need for us to really ramp up and deploy mitigation activities. Obviously, the most effective mitigation is to be calm and social distance, as my tank says here. Also, it's wearing masks, it's staying uh, very, very social distance from friends, staying at home, um, really mitigating your risk, lowering the quantity and stops that you make uh, when you're out and about, and just being really cognizant of exposure, even, you know, lowering going out, like, you know, being outside when you gather, not inside and, and smaller groups, smaller quantities. Okay, SLC's governor, oh good, mandated mask wearing, that's good. Salt Lake City, I know Clive uh, is in Salt Lake City, one of our YouTube viewers, and she was saying that it's definitely gotten pretty intense there. Um, so one of the things that um, is very disturbing right now that we, I read a report on this uh, probably around dinner time last night, um, Alabama, the University of Alabama, uh, there are students throwing COVID parties. Legit, this is for like totally real, confirmed by the state contact tracers and uh, the sheriff's department. These college kids are um, having parties, uh, some aware and some unaware that there are individuals at the party that have COVID. They have, you know, a bowl or some sort of device where they throw money in and they, it's a bit as a bet. So they bet on who will get COVID first. <laughs> like this is some fun thing to bet on. It's kind of crazy. Um, but that I, I have a feeling that's not just isolated to Alabama, uh, but it could explain why I was reporting a lot a few weeks ago that Alabama uh, football players were, 
uh, testing positive, it could very well be that there's a lot going on. And that might end up changing how Alabama addresses bringing kids back onto campus. <laughs> maybe, maybe not, but we'll, we'll kind of see. Um, McDonald's has announced that they're going to um, slow the phase of the reopening for the next 21 days. They are not going to be reopening dining rooms in places that had planned on reopening. I didn't see anything that they're going to scale back. So if they're already reopened in certain areas, I didn't get that. They're scaling it back. Um, the NFL is cutting the two week, uh, the preseason by two weeks. So they're eliminating the first and fourth uh, preseason games and are going to articulate it in a way that there's one home game and one away game. I, I, I don't know. I, I just, I just don't see us getting out of this anytime soon with the numbers at 50,000 right now. Um, but they did say that there is discussion that if you do go to a game that you might be asked to sign a COVID waiver form, waiving your rights and acknowledging that you are at potential risk of catching the virus. Um, I did see that uh, one of the upstate New York teams, I can't remember, I think it's the Bills, Buffalo Bills, we're more college people in our college football fans in our household. Um, the Bills had identified that they would give refunds to Canadians uh, because we now have that border. The border's locked down and, and uh, <laughs> so they won't be coming to America to watch a game. So they're refunding those individual the season ticket holders for the season. Uh, just a quick little update. We have um, 30, currently there are 30 vaccines on in, in trial, uh, or 30 vaccines that are intending to go to clinical trial with human trials right now. 16 already, 16 uh, vaccines are in human trials. So uh, the one that's really pushing forward is the one that's called Moderna. Um, and there's lots of lots of uh, focus on them as possibly the first to roll it out. That's the one out of the UK and the University of Oxford I've talked about. Um, and so, geez, there's just a lot of news, friends. <laughs> Sometimes it's overwhelming. Okay, let's let's dig into the first of our reports. So the first report, and I know yesterday we pulled the trigger. Uh, we decided that we are going to hold Gabriel. Um, he, we're going to have Gabriel at home that we removed him from, or are in the proactive process of removing him from his school for the 2020, 21 school year. Um, we've got some plans within what we're going to do, uh, looking at some virtual resources, my engagement with him and possibly, uh, tutor teacher type of situation. So kids, there's been a lot of discussion, the Academy of, or the Pediatric Association, the American Association of Pediatrics came out and said, you know, we encourage that all kids go to school. Well, we now have a, literally this just came out this week. Um, we have a study out specifically, and this is what I've been waiting on. I've been waiting on identifying the data about kids and children in the US. Right now, up until this, we haven't had a whole lot of information and data specifically about this inflammatory situation we're seeing with more kids. Now, we also have to be aware globally, the US, we do see our community at large. We have a standard American diet. Uh, we know obesity rates are really high with kids. We see greater underlying health conditions earlier and younger. And we also know from reports in the last few years that the younger generation will not outlive. So they won't live longer than the previous generation because of all of those factors, lack of exercise changes in schools and no PE, more sedentary lifestyles. They're at home. They're on, you know, on online and not exercising and being out like we were when we were little. So because of that, we also need to be very cognizant of how this virus affects children. And there are differences between you know, the different communities and, and, and areas, countries that have affected Italian children are way more active than US kids, they're healthier. And we know this from from data. So this is a journal out of the New England. Uh, so the New England Journal of Medicine, it is an article entitled multi system inflammatory syndrome in US children, and adolescents, so teenagers, and it references uh, specifically surveillance from March 15th to May 20th in the pediatric centers, uh, children or, or at the age 21 and younger. 
um, and they identify the impact of COVID on these individuals. So the median age of, um, of the children was 8.3 years. Um, they, the report was on 186 patients in 26 states. Um, and they looked at, um, they tested positive either by saliva, um, nasal swab or blood as well as antibody testing. Um, but the, all of them, um, not all of them, but a good majority of them were hospitalized. 88% were hospitalized and they break out the different organ system involvement with the children. Um, and ultimately they are the Kawasaki, uh, disease, this inflammatory response. They are cardiovascular hematologic, uh, that's blood oriented, uh, mucocutaneous, respiratory, mucocutaneous being some of the mucous membranes, some of the eye infections and things like that, coronary, um, uh, artery aneurysms, mechanical ventilation was needed. They were in ICU. And they also talk a little bit about some of the biomarkers. So they dig into the cases of kids here in the US. Um, and this, this specifically focuses in on uh, the fact that 75% of the children with severe COVID had zero underlying previous health conditions. So that is really critical because we say we've known up to this point that children uh, are going to be asymptomatic, doesn't really affect kids. But for kids who do get it and it becomes severe, 75% of them would be what we classify as healthy. So this becomes really critical as parents that we are just aware of this, this data. Um, so they, they dig way more into um, some of the different um, uh, in, infection, the infections underlying the, co co not comorbidities, but the underlying aspects um, at play. They also dig into, and I think this is really kind of interesting. Um, they dig into a map. So they highlight where they see a greater percentage of these cases. In Georgia, we're, we're not in the clear. Um, and this matches up with some of the data we know about Georgia kids and the unhealthy nature of the children. Up here we saw uh, in New York and Michigan, also Massachusetts and New Jersey. Now this also is because we had the spikes. We might see Arizona come online. We might see Florida and Arizona additionally, we don't know, but this is as of where we were uh, up through May. Um, but they identify the increase. So as the, the, the US was increasing, we started to see an increase in these cases with um, the children. So there's definitely some correspondence there. So, um, you know, there, the critical aspect here for us as parents is just to really be cognizant of some of the system involvement. Um, I'll break out some of the, the things that would be a factor. Um, so they identified gastrointestinal, uh, cardiac, hematologic blood, that's potentially sickle cell as well, uh, mucocutaneous, respiratory, uh, musculoskeletal, and then lower levels, we had renal and neurologic um, involvement. And the biggest aspect were, and they, they've got them all in these bar charts, but bar charts, but this is this red, this was the biggest impact cardiovascular. So we saw uh, low blood pressure, reduce the infection, actually it, the COVID infected the heart. And we saw or see with kids, a reduction in the functionality of their heart. Um, and so, you know, the gastro GI related involvement is something parents should be cognizant of. Are there any, you know, aches and pains or gurgly belly, diarrhea, um, any of those symptoms? Also, uh, mucocutaneous. So are they presenting with COVID toes? Are they having pink eye or any kind of weird mucosal related infections, redness and inflammation? A respiratory issues, challenge breathing. So that would be um, critical for parents, not a bad idea to get your uh, pulse ox for children and to have this at home with you. Um, so this just really, it's, it's eye-opening in terms of just uh, how extensive this is within kids if they do get sick. So if it does become severe, 
uh, it can be pretty overwhelming to their little bodies. Okay, so that's first report. The second report um, that I wanna highlight is out of the Lancet. Let's see here, is this it? Actually, no, I didn't, rep I didn't print this off, but the Lancet um, just posted a global health uh, report and they are predicting that um, there will be a significant uh, impact on babies this year, babies and young children. Um, they are going to face food and health um, challenges in multiple state, in multiple countries. So they looked at low and medium income countries and identified that there already have been increases in the maternal fatality rates and also reduction in food supply in that they predicted that a million children would go hungry um, and have health complications from that. So that is just kind of overwhelming with children and the world. Um, and some other details. So there, there are two fresh off the presses reports about face masks. So this is what we're going to talk about today. I'll make sure I link these. I'm going to try on Instagram to do a screenshot and it's just, you can swipe up. Um, that swipe up feature is really exciting. Now that we have that, you can swipe up to any products I recommend as well as any research. So I'm going to start off <clears throat> with this particular research. This came out it's it, it'll be in the publicated the, the, the actual physical publication for August, which comes out in July. Um, but this is online. It's community use of face masks and COVID evidence from a natural experiment of state mandates in the U.S. So this actually identifies the U.S. and our face mask wearing and um, articulates specifically the impact and the positive nature of community use of face masks. So this looks at, and this is out of the University of, um, I believe it's out of Washington, um, but it specifically details more information about um, face mask wearing, the impact when even employers um, use face masks, and they, they are extrapolate that the mandates of face mask wearing um, could potentially have reduced 230 to 450,000 COVID cases. And this is by May 22nd. Um, so there is definitely indication that there is mitigation reduction. Uh, so we mitigate the spread by using face masks. And they, they highlight all the data. Um, let's see, I've got some... Let's see. Oh, this didn't, I thought it gave, uh, there was a bar chart I, I meant to print out, but specifically it highlights um, between April 8th and May 15th. They even highlight uh, the Was Washington District of Columbia. Um, and they basically said the longer the face mask mandate uh, was implemented, that the higher reduction they saw. Um, and out of 20 states that only mandated employee only wearing a face mask. So if you go into a store, you're not required to wear a face mask, but the employees, there was no impact there. But in the cases in the states where the employee had to wear it and you had to wear it, they saw great reduction and a mitigation. So this is uh, a really critical piece. This is, um, let's see, this is out of the Journal of Health Affairs. And uh, it's Project HOPE, the People to People Health Foundation. Um, and this is, I think, really going to be impactful as well. Here's another one. So um, this is out of the, this is straight, this is totally new. This is out of, um, let's see, FAU. And it's out of the Journal of, what is this called? Physics of Fluids. I've highlighted them before. They've done a little bit more about like the transmission. MIT put out, a, um, this is a journal. So uh, Physics of Fluids is a journal. This was produced by a professor at a, a FAU, Florida Atlantic University. Um, and what they do is, this is called Visualizing the Effectiveness of Face Masks in uh, Obstructing Respiratory Jets. So meaning viral particles. And they actually have this one, they actually have some really great, really great uh, visuals where the wearing of face masks versus not and the measurement of particles that come out, they actually go three feet, six feet, nine feet and 12 feet. 
And so they identify just how far, and we've already known this, we know that viral particles, if somebody coughs, it can go 23 to 27 feet. Um, and so that is something that is critical. You can kind of see just how extended, uh, not, a, you know, when somebody's not wearing a mask, how it can move. So this is three feet and then it moves to six and then to nine and 12. They also showcase um, the, the what, what's really great about this particular um, study is it identifies the best materials to wear for face masks. So they try out and they experiment with, if you're wearing a bandana, what's the leakage like? If you're wearing a two layer cotton mask, if you're wearing a cone shaped mask, if you're wearing a surgical mask, and I have all of, I've kind of compiled all those today um, in, in the effectiveness. So, you know, originally I think the Surgeon General even did a video on YouTube and um, on the socials about how to fold. You can use any type of material and, you know, people are using bandanas. Those are proven not to be effective. And so this is what's really critical for all of the naysayers, the anti-maskers. Um, and, you know, there's a phrase going around that's not very nice and friendly towards the, the anti-maskers. But the, the reality is that we need to be cognizant of what type of mask are we using. And, and in some ways, they're right. Some of these masks and face coverings people are wearing are not effective. This proves it. So it identifies what type of mask is going to be most effective um, in terms of, of, of what type of, of covering. So this first one is the handkerchief. So a face mask constructed using a folded handkerchief and they identify a cough and what that looks like. And then um, they also identify a homemade face mask. This is more of the kind like my friend Sarah makes and I'll show you those. I've got ones that Gabriel, um, we've got for Gabriel, just some of the potential leakage. So the leakage through the mask is up here at the nose. This is where it's critical. You want a cinching. And I actually recommended that she put in that and that would take care of the, the, this particle. So this is just without a nose cinch, but you can see where the particles go. But I mean, look at the difference. Cough goes through, cough does not. Okay. The other uh, aspect that they look at are off the shelf cone style mask. Um, and they identify um, a coughing, uh, and then the leakage with this. So this is a cone shaped mask and they show a little bit of leakage. This is leakage from the top and some leakage through the mask here. But that gives you an idea of, of some of the protection that we get. Um, and this, so the materials they looked at, uh, they identified uncovered. The distance goes over eight feet. A bandana, which would they identified the material would be elastic t-shirt type of material. You know, some bandanas are a little different, but um, 85 thread, kind of like 85 threads per inch. I don't know if that's a thread count or not, but that the jet distance is three feet and seven inches. Folded handkerchief that's cotton, 55 threads, the out, outbound is one foot and three inches. Stitched mask, which is cotton, they said quilted, quilting cotton. At 70 threads, the distance is 2.5 inches. And then a commercial mask, uh, unknown material, random fibers, eight inches. So there's different degrees of protection that we get based on the material. So they actually run data on the material. So when we have anti-maskers that are like, bandanas don't work, ding, ding, they're right. But there are certain types of materials and types of masks that are effective. And we now quantified this. Now, I also want to highlight that one of the things in the debate about wearing masks, nobody debated washing their hands, you know, the, the sanitary nature of hand washing and singing the birthday song, as we tell Gabriel, you know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, really good washing outside, in between the fingers, underneath the nails, really covering, we've seen, you know, under light and all of that. Nobody had an issue, but we have an issue with the masks. Part of the challenge is that up until some more recent uh, data, we didn't have research that really defined the, the specifics on the effectiveness. We also, we don't still have any type of large scale clinical um, 
run mask wearing, <laughs> um, per, you know, trial, we don't have a clinical trial of mask wearing and the prevention of uh, the pandemic. We do have like this is what we call data that comes from um, simulations. So we do have a lot of da data on face mask simulations where, you know, they have somebody wear a covering and they can then articulate and measure the mask and the particulates. This is, is, this is very high quality data. Um, and the challenge here, I'm just losing all my stuff over here. The challenge is that, um, you know, the, the met, the previous data that I, I see, and I've been reading, you know, they've posted all their links and I read them. A lot of the anti-maskers will reference things, mask coverings for the flu, and they'll reference it from um, even some years where there's just a spotty data. You know, so one of the years that one of the reports came out, it wasn't a high flu season. Um, and then also it doesn't break out the type of masks and specifically there are a few in the um, SARS, but we don't have a whole lot of data. So that is something that we just need to be cognizant of. We are going to be, believe me, there are going to be scientists running a ton more of these. As we get so much public pushback, the scientists are going to prove them incorrect. Um, and really it's all about mitigation. It's about lowering our risk and the community spread. The, we do know we can look at the existing data in COVID and we can identify how effective it's been. Um, there also are, uh, let's see, I have additional reviews. Um, you know, we have, we just have a ton of information. We know the, you know, uh, the transmission, the aerodynamic nature of these particles. We know the, um, the dynamics of the spreading. So this is something that, um, let's see, kind of digs into more uh, detail about the actual spread uh, via uh, wearing masks and the infection rate. So we have a lot of a lot of specific information. We've got the information with the golden hamsters and some face coverings and even filtration, the effectiveness of lowering the spread. Um, we just we have a lot of data um, detailed even when face mask is worn in the homes. So this is a report from it's a reduction of secondary transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in households by face mask wearing. So individuals that were quarantined at home, there was a lower transmission rate for those, for those families that both parties, the infected and the non-infected caregiver, had mask wearing and it lowered the transmission. So we are getting data that's proving it. And that is one concern that I have uh, with folks that are really, really anti-masking. They're just not looking at the right data. Um, so they're pulling data that supports their, their case. This I think is one of the most critical. I, I talked about this when it came out, I think a month or two ago. This is out of Texas A&M. This is the identifying airborne transmission as a dominant route for the spread of COVID. Um, it, it identifies if you don't wear a mask or have any type of effective mitigation that involves uh, facial coverings, that includes eyes, that you are not going to lower the spread and that, that will yield what we're dealing with now. One of the things I want to highlight, the researcher, uh, one of the researchers, Mario Molina, he's a co-recipient of the 1995 Nobel Prize of Chemistry. He identified the ozone threat of the halo or halo carbon gases to, um, to the ozone layer. So the, these are not random scientists. These are people that are involved in data research that are, uh, have been proven to be some of the best in the world at what they do. This came out in, uh, in May, middle of May, and it looked at pandemic trends in the epicenters. At this point, it was the US, Italy, and China at that point that it had identified. And it really looked at understanding the impacts of face coverings. And so they identify, for instance, in Italy between April 6th and May 9th, and then New York from April 17th and May 9th, that the correlation of um, the re reduction and the re re reduction of the spread came when there was mandates of both social distancing and face mask covering. 
Um, and so they literally say that there's um, a linearity of the infection curve prior to the onset of the face mask or face covering rule. Italy had the rule, New York had it as well. And they show that the daily new infection in New York, New York City decreased with a slope of 106 cases per day. So they show the reduction. Um, and ultimately what they compare is they look at this and this is really great. I don't know if you guys remember me showing you guys this if you were on it, but they have uh, the kind of time marker. So this was New York and the US. So New York specifically, they employed social distancing, then they did stay at home. This is when it really got high. And then this blue line here, this is when face masks were required and they showed a really big dip. Then the US, we have social distancing, staying at home, but no face mask requirement. And we have, I mean, this, this is back from May. So we have gone way up here. Um, but this is indicative of the effectiveness and they highlight that. They also created some really great visuals for people about the transmission, the particle. We know that from the additional reports that I've highlighted, um, you know, viral shedding from coughing, sneezing, um, you know, settling with uh, contamination, it's dispersed in the air. And then they dig into this specific uh, representation where this is this is their data played out in kind of a, a actual format, a flow chart, if you will. So you have you know aerosols, there's air, airborne transmission and uh, droplets. So you have aerosol, it's aerosolized and droplets. So aerosolized, it's in the air from you know the plumes, and then you have droplets, and you ultimately get uh, airborne transmission or contract transmission. There's two ways of getting it. So you maybe touch a surface and then you touch your eyes that's a contact transmission. You inhale air because somebody's not wearing a mask and you're not wearing a mask, that would be what we call airborne transmission. So there's two ways of having this infection come into your body. They identify that. So in both cases where we have containment is through social distancing and face mask wearing, and then the red is quarantine and social distancing. This is just literally social distancing. You still have the pandemic. So they add in two factors that are highly effective in mitigation, and it is the face mask covers and this. So we have face mask covering and quarantine on both categories. That is containment. So they break that down. They really put it together for policy, uh, which has been completely ignored <laughs> for the most part. Uh, but cities and, and mayors can pull this data and, you know, take advantage of that. Same with the council members who are voting on uh, face mask wearing. So that is, that's really critical. Um, the Lancet also, there's a new um, article from the Lancet. And let me see, I've got that here. Just lots of data. Um, okay. So there's, this is, where is it? Oh, let's see. Well, these, let's see. Well, th these are additional. So I'll just highlight, um, you know, physical distancing, face mask, and eye protection person to person. They highlight, and even wearing, you know, eye protection is going to be critical. Um, that lowers that aerosolized spread. And again, avoiding contacting, you know, touching your eyes lowers the contact spread. And um, this also identifies... Um, oh, this was the study. This was the mother, the study about kids, the early estimates of the indirect effect of COVID. That was the highlight about um, a million children are going to go hungry. <sighs> so um, that was that data today. Um, but the Lancet also uh, reviewed 44, um, actually, this is the June 1st. So yeah, so this, this study specifically, this came out of the Lancet. Um, this identified 44 studies. So this looked at all these additional studies I've talked about, 44 studies, 16 countries, 25,000 people. And it looked at the effectiveness of social distancing, eye coverings, face shields, um, and them individually or some combination of them. And ultimately it came to the conclusion that you can lower uh, transmission by 80% by employing one of those. It didn't dig into specifically 
uh, whether they're, you know, which specific combination is the most effective. That's the one challenge I have with this, but it digs into a lot of the different uh, ways that we can use to mitigate. So, and they, these, uh, let's see. Yeah, these, these are different studies that they pull. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. Um, some of the, there are some, you know, research on Mar MERS and SARS, uh, but we also have a good amount of COVID related research about um, the different data. And at the end, they actually list a lot of the research. So I really appreciated that. So friends, that's really, you know, the data is out there. Face masks, face coverings are effective. Obviously there are different types and I want to share with you some. So what um, the most effective, this physics, um, fluids of physics, this is the data that just came out. Um, you'll probably guarantee this will be a big discussion today, as long as nothing crazy happens. But I want to highlight, this is the type of mask my friend Sarah makes that is two layers. It's got the thicker material. And I actually use a carbon, a five layer carbon insert. So it even bolsters it. They didn't add this in. But what's critical with these is that you can adjust the nose and you can get really, you can get tighter through these little adjustments. So you can tie. Um, Sarah sells these on Etsy. They're available down below if you want to grab those. Now, the other thing that cone shaped that they recommended, this is an N95 mask, a cone shaped mask. I've got links where you can grab these down below. This is the mask. Now there's, you know, if I don't adjust it, I can kind of adjust it a little bit, but there's possibly still some spread. For me, the way my uh, chin is, there's still some opening. So that's where we see some of those differences. So, you know, there's, it becomes critical that, I really do believe we need to have different masks for different occasions. And, you know, for when you are lightly socializing outside, you'd want something a little lighter, you know, which might be this, this is a surgical mask. And I, I use these in my clinic. It's very basic. It's not, you know, it does pinch here, but you've got some opening here. It fits a little better down here for me, but still there's some of that here, but at least it protects me. Um, but this would be something, as we know, these coverings, if two people have coverings and they're socially gathered or they're somewhat socially distanced in a gathering, we know the particle, just the distance is, there's a variance there. Um, I also want to recommend, and I, I ordered these very easily on Amazon, so you can, I've got a link to these. This is for, no, I didn't take this, there's a internal and internal and external cover, I didn't take it off. This is for all of you who are very concerned about covering your mouth. If you want a face shield, they sell these. This is so comfortable. It is just this like really soft fabric. Um, if I take the film off, because I'm not going to wear this, I'm not taking the film off, but there's a film. You can actually see, you can read, you can work with this. Super soft material. This is foamy-like material. <clears throat> you can buy 10 of these for like 24 bucks. Very inexpensive something is better than nothing. Um, you can also, if you don't like how intense the masks are, surgical masks are, are, I believe they're going to be a little bit easier for some of you to breathe through. They're not as probably just the feeling of it being so intense. So you could do this, you could double it up. And so you can be out and about, you want to make sure it fits well and kind of cinch it in. But this is a way for you to protect your eyes and even limit some of this coming outbound, but also to protect things coming into you. So I want to give you all options because I do know that many of you do have some breathing challenges and there might be some health concerns or even anxiety. And I'm not minimizing that. And that is not what I'm about. But I definitely am about keeping all of you safe. And we are in a situation here in the US where this is, this is a, like, to even say it's a pandemic, this is, we're in it and we've been in it for a while. And so it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal, but this is a really serious big deal. We are not going to go back to any type of sense of normalcy 
unless we get our act together. And it takes all of us to work together. On the kid front, I do want to address this because this is something we've geared up with Gabriel. And if we were to send him to school, and even when we do have somebody in, in our home that might be um, helping educate him, I, I've grabbed cloth masks. So I grabbed these. I've got a link to this. These are really, they're not as, as powerful as a thicker mask. Like these are our thicker masks that you can grab on Etsy. They actually allow us to put an insert in as well. But this super cute. I mean, this is obviously for Gabriel. So it's really small, but you know, little Paw Patrol, they've got ones for little girls, you know, they've got the construction vehicles. This is really easy. It goes around the ear and goes around their little faces. It gives them some sort of protection. If you do have kids in school, you need to start equipping yourself with these. We don't know if, you know, schools are going to be mandating this. I think they're, everybody's kind of waiting on the CDC. The other thing is they've got these kids masks. I grabbed these on, on Amazon. They came literally like that. Same with these, like this, the um, Kiwi, I can't remember her name. It's Kiwi something. She sent us these. Literally, I ordered them two days, three days later, boom, they were here. And there's another one I've got in the wash, but he is so excited about Paw Patrol and they've got Frozen, they've got everything. Um, but also in the front with kids, these are these are not surgical masks, but they're pretty darn close to it. But they have uh, different colors. So if you do have kids, grandkids, this isn't a bad idea to invest in getting these. So different colors, they have this one super cute especially if your children have any underlying health conditions, autoimmunity, gut imbalances, you know, the gastro uh, aspect, any inflammatory related stuff. You know, if your kids have had any heart challenges, holes in the hearts, any surgeries when they're young, you definitely want to make sure they're equipped. So this is for little kids. I mean, it does fit an adult face, but obviously like it's going to fit kids better, but it's, this is better than nothing. And with schools, you know, that was our big concern with Gabriel is he's so young. He's four. He hates it when I wear these masks. And I, I load up, like I double up when I go out and I've only gone out like three, maybe four times. You know, I wear this. I'm serious. Like this is, it's no joke in our, in our household, especially with Brian and his autoimmunity where his body, if he gets sick, his platelet level dives and then he need transfusions of all sorts. I wear this and then I, I, add in. So I do a new uh, carbon filter. I put this in. I'm just showing you what I do. Hopefully it'll inspire some of you. So I adjust this and then I get this on. Let's see. It's kind of, I'm not going to totally adjust it here, but you know, it, it's cinched up. Like usually I put this up here, Let's do this right here. but you can see, you know, there's a little so I cinch this in and then I adjust this back here and it fits well. Like I, I just feel like it gives me extra, extra protection. One of, one of the challenges here in Georgia is nobody's wearing them. And, you know, if you are in an area or state where people are not taking it seriously or you're going to an event or, you know, you're in a work setting, you're going to have to play around with what works well for you. But I do want to highlight some tips. Okay, so let me grab my tips here. I printed them off. Let's see. Hold on one second. So, oh, and then I also have this one too. So I have a pair and a spare. So that becomes really critical that you, oh, here it is. Um, it becomes really critical that you think about, you want to have maybe several versions. Maybe you want to have, you know, your surgical mask. And then maybe you also want to have a few for your kids. Um, and you can clean these with the UV uh, mask filter. And I'll, I'll put these in. I'll put the UV filter. But this literally like is a cleaning process. And you can put your masks in here. And so, you know, we wash ours. But this is uh, USB powered. So if you're in the car, you're moving from one place to one place, you can sanitize it on the go. Um, so that it makes it a little bit easier for you, you know, in terms of, um, of, of getting protection um, and sanitizing it in the event that you have to have to go out and about. But you definitely want to look at having multiple versions. 
Um, and definitely a parent a spare a few also in the event that you need to give some away. I mean, we have, we give masks away to our uh, delivery drivers, our mail carrier, I always put hand sanitizer and a mask in a little envelope. Oh, Instagram, you guys are going to wrap uh, We've been an hour. I'm just going to continue on YouTube. So if you guys want to continue and definitely I'll post links down below so you can grab those. All right. Join me on YouTube. Okay. So, and uh, let me just download this. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I think is really critical is that we just really be cognizant of um, all the different options that we have in terms of mask wearing. But also, you know, when we're wearing cloth masks, we have to have, I've, I, got, I have, feel like I have to give you some pointers in terms of putting them on and putting them off. Um, especially when you are coming out of a store and you're taking them off. The first thing is uh, when you when you wear it, you place your mask over your mouth and nose. So that's number one. Even before, I always hand sanitize. So I hand sanitize. Sometimes I might have gloves on, but I hand sanitize to not infect. And then I put this on and then you loop behind the ears. You want to make sure it's snug. So some loops uh, have adjustment. I know others will do like a little, they'll do a little tie to make it fit better. And then they will cinch. This part here is really critical. You want to get it so it fits comfortably. This cone, this is a cone shape. This cone probably is most effective for people who are talking a lot because you can talk and then, you know, as I breathe in, it might, this is where it could cause a lot of anxiety for people and it can move around, you know, so like I'm talking right now and it's moving. Um, so that is another aspect too, in terms of when you, what activities you are. Sometimes when you're shopping, you're not talking, so you can use something else, but this would be really effective for possibly some customer service agents. Now, when you're wearing it, you want to make sure you don't touch it. I see this a lot. I see people go like this. And then, you know, and they haven't sanitized their hands. And then, you know, they might even touch. I mean, I watched somebody um, on TV that literally, like, he went to adjust and it came to here. And then he had to pop it up here. So you just really be cognizant, you know, if in the cone, you can kind of in the middle, pull down and then pull back up. That way you're not touching inside the mask. Um, if you do touch, make sure you sanitize your hands. So anytime before you touch your mask, make sure you're sanitizing your hands. So you're protecting your face um, and minimizing it. Now to remove it, the best way is to just take off like this so that you minimize touching your nose and your, your mouth. Um, the other thing you wanna do is you wanna wash, the best is to wash your hands. So I use my little handies, and I'll post a link to those, my handies or hand sanitizer, but for sure you wanna wash your, wash your hands. And then you want to regularly uh, cleanse. So these are disposables, but if you want to use the UV, this is a good way of cleaning it. You know, all of the, these cloth ones you want to wash and you want to wash in, in a hot cycle. So 135 degrees is what kills the viral particles. You can also put this in the UV and then wash it. That ensures that you kill the DNA strand. Um, now, it, it is very important that if you literally cannot breathe, you don't want to wear a mask. If you cannot breathe, or maybe you're on oxygen, and we do have a lot of uh, patients and followers that might have oxygen tanks, you could wear a face shield. So the face shield becomes another element in your protection in the event that the masks, you know, either the cone or the um, the, the cloth is, is con too constrictive. This is better than nothing. So when we say you need to wear a mask, it's really a face covering. The best source is a mask. In the event that you have breathing troubles or children under the age of two, um, they do have children's versions. I haven't gotten one for Gabriel. Actually, I did, uh, but it's on its way. Um, but this is something where you want to be really cognizant to make sure you have all of the right tools for you in the event that you go out. The other thing, too, is to monitor um, how well it fits. So a lot of the N95s, and I've gotten this as a big argument, you know, face masks don't work unless they are absolutely fitted. Here's the deal. Nothing is going to be 100%, but something is better than nothing. It would be as if you just fail to wash your hands all day long 
that's the equivalent. You wash your hands, you clean them. It's critical that you also have some sort of protection face and, and, you know, eye, nose and mouth protection. If it's going to be a loose face shield, that's better than nothing friends. Uh, but critical, you know, a mask would be very critical to wear. And then also I brought these Gabriel loves these. These are his little, his little, um, his swim goggles, but literally having some goggles, they have adult goggles. They also have, um, larger, uh, like scientific goggles. Those are all very good options as well as your sunglasses, even though you don't get that protection, something's better than nothing. So if you don't want to invest in that, I have a little something in my eye. Um, so this is, I wanted to go over this because I also know people are concerned. People aren't wearing them right. You know, we have a lot of folks that uh, so annoying when you see them, they are wearing it like this. Okay. This doesn't qualify. This is not protection at all. You just look goofy, uh, wearing it like this. That's not effective. Wearing it like this, not effective. Uh, where the nose is out, you want it to be, you want it to fit snugly under the chin and you want it to, you want to cinch it in. And that is effective mask wearing. You want extra layer of protection. You add your face shield or glasses and make sure that you keep it on. You don't really play around with or adjust it. I know that I had to make a run to office depot, I think two weeks ago. And one of the guys, he had, <laughs> He had a surgical mask. He had this. It was like this. I walk in. He's like, hi, can I help you? <laughs> like, uh, hello, please put your mask on, buddy. And so he did, you know, and he, he, he didn't clean his hands. He didn't sanitize, you know, so like it wasn't exactly the best process for him. But <clears throat> there are people in stores that are walking around like this. And I don't know if they forget or it's just they're just still getting used to this. This is definitely a new process here for us in the U.S., um, so I just want to highlight that for, for everybody, you know, we, we're dealing with a whole new requirement and we're also dealing with, um, we're dealing with a population that is just really pushing against this for a multitude of reasons. But the reality is we are dealing with a massive outbreak and, um, it's very possible that we are going to see today's yesterday and today's 50,000 plus positive cases turn into a nightmare in the hospital setting in the next two to three weeks. Um, and then we are approaching 4th of July holiday this weekend, Memorial Day rocked, you know, June. And we're going to see that possibly happen towards the end of July. And that's when school is supposed to start for all you parents out there that are really concerned about school it becomes really critical. Everybody starts to get into this game of they, they get themselves in and, and being a part of the solution, which is wearing face masks, face shields, eye covers, and limiting the spread, staying at home and mitigating the risk. Okay, so um, I do wanna notate for all of you who are still with me, please give me a thumbs up, I'm really grateful. Saturday, I'm gonna take the day off. So it's 4th of July holiday. Obviously we're not going anywhere doing anything, but I'm just gonna take it as a holiday. So tomorrow will be my live Q and A um, and I'll post on our community tab, also post on Instagram. Um, and if you guys don't follow me, I'm going to post in the live chat. Please do follow me over on um, Instagram. Sometimes when um, this buffers, I've had a chat with our Comcast um, for our internet. It should be better. Uh, so if we're increasing our speed quite a bit. Um, but I've got a link down below. I hope you'll follow me over on Instagram because I do post other things and um, Instagram TV now is housing all these videos, but I really wanted to highlight, we do have a lot of research. We do have a lot of evidence. You know, the more we get uh, away from the beginning of this, we have more data, but I think what really, what's really eye opening, gosh, there's so much data friends. I have to get more ink too. Um, what's really eye opening is this. So I'll post all of these. I've got like five, uh, articles for you to check out and peruse. And uh, I'm grateful for all of you for joining. Um, you know, I know there are a lot of naysayers. And the problem is that, you know, there are a lot of people who think they're totally fine. They're invincible. They're younger. You know, they don't have any under health, underlying health conditions. But a lot of parents, as we see in this study, thought their kids were perfectly fine and might not have protected them with face coverings and, you know, um, masks and whatnot. And they found that 75% of the children who suffer from 
um, this, this particular syndrome, very similar to Kawasaki, they had no underlying health conditions and guarantee there's parental guilt happening. And that is a terrible place to be. It's better to be proactive. And what's the harm of wearing a mask? If you don't have any breathing problems, you don't have any asthma, maybe you have a little anxiety, but that's easy to overcome. You can take a little Bach flower, do a little deep breathing, the whole dizziness, the, you know, people saying it's a, a as asphyxiation, you know, the, the data is not out on it. And, um, you know, we, we just cannot succumb to this misinformation. And there's a huge misinformation campaign happening where people are referencing data that's just not effective and it's not relevant. There are now multiple pieces of data relevant with COVID-19 and the effectiveness of uh, risk mitigation and transmission reduction by using face masks, face coverings. We can't get away from that. It is what it is. And science is science, data is data. And I will continue to present that. Um, I don't play in the world of misinformation campaigns. I don't get into the world of conspiracy theories. Yes, I'm a naturopath and everything I recommend is natural in its orientation. As far as I checked, face coverings are pretty darn natural, friends. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, really, let's be very clear on our, um, our efforts. It's a collective body and we've got to come in it together. And Shelby says, knowledge is power. Um, and, you know, the one thing, too, I found is that some people just don't want to hear it. They just don't want to be told something different than what they're thinking. And I don't know how we get around that. Um, you know, people have dug their heels in the sand. And even, you know, we're seeing the economic impact of these anti-maskers. Um, they are causing businesses to close because they're raising such a stink and causing such anxiety and angst for the employees that the businesses are like, screw it, we're not opening. That is something I would love to see studied is how many businesses have closed because of the anti-maskers and the global econ or the at least national economic hit there. And you know, what's what's the shame of, of wearing a mask? I mean, it's just do the right thing, people. This is not about you, it's about other people. Um, and the CDC is researching possibly the impact to you as well on a positive note that it might save your life and lower your own risk. So I think this is critical. Um, just we be cognizant of the facts and I'll always bring it to you, friends. So I see a lot of people on here, so I really am grateful. Please hit that like button, hit the share. Let's get this out there on YouTube. And um, I really appreciate that. Sarah, Sharon says, the parents I know are requiring their kids 20 somethings coming back home from Florida to go get tested. It's required here in Connecticut. They are trying to make it required to get tested before you fly. Yeah, I mean, the testing is gonna be the critical aspect. And, and you know, we are not out of, out of the woods on the fact that we don't have enough tests available. Florida's running out. Um, and that poses a challenge. It's not just that we're testing more people, it's more people, the percentages who are testing are testing positive. That is what community spread is. That is uh, the, the, the wildfire that this virus is. And we know it's mutated. The mutation that I reported, I think three weeks ago, maybe it's four, I don't know, it's all blending together, but the, the virus is mutated in a way that the little horn or the, you know, the little uh, tentacles, the spikes, um, they've doubled, the quantity of spikes has increased and the efficacy of the spike ad adhering to the human host um, is great. And part of the mutation is to make sure that the human host does not die. So one of the things that viruses do is they constantly evolve to keep themselves alive. So there, were, there was a higher death percentage, uh, possibly because it's, you know, for a multitude of reasons. One, it's new, immune systems never seen it. Two, uh, we had no sense of what possible therapeutics would be effective. You know, China wasn't rolling out remdesivir or any of the other things that we're now using, uh, even antibodies. So that could be a factor when people are saying, oh, well, the death rate, you know, the, the percentage of deaths has decreased. That could be part of it. But it also could very well be part of that mutation of the virus and that it is needing the host to lie. To, it needs the host to survive. It can't kill off the host because it kills off that chance to spread. And so 
that might also be part of the reason why we're seeing uh, the super spread that we're in right now. And possibly it might mutate again. Who knows? Um, so uh, Shelby says, appreciate who you are and all you do. Beloved, thank you. Tomorrow, yes, Q&A, live Friday. And Saturday, I'll be off. So Saturday and Sunday, we'll have no show. And then Monday, we'll resume. Uh, Monday, supposedly, Brian's going back to work. I don't know. I don't even know if I t told you guys somebody at his work had tested positive, like after he came home a few days later or a week later. Uh, so it's pretty crazy. So I really appreciate all of you for getting behind this. I know there are a lot of people who are against this. I'll probably get tons of hate today on Instagram. But the funny part is when the haters go hating and they start commenting, it's really awesome for the algorithm. So I will take the algorithm wins, even though they're nasty <laughs> <laughs> fall into the mask hole category. Uh, it is what it is. And we really, we just need to get the word out there. And, uh, you know, there is, th this is the right side of this. And, um, you know, we need to stay on the right side and the healthy side. And um, I, I don't know anything more natural than wearing <laughs> a homemade cloth <laughs> mask supporting another small business owner. Like, that seems to be a no brainer to me. So anyway, friends, you can grab my friend, Sarah. She's making her masks. These are awesome. She has all different designs. Uh, her link's down below. The kids' masks are down below. I'll add some additional links. And uh, yeah, so tune in tomorrow. Live Q&A Friday. Yay. Happy Thursday, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Really appreciate your involvement, encouragement. Love the likes, all your participation. Please hit that share button. And if you haven't subscribed, I hope you will. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you later. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Pat, again. Appreciate you.